Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over chapter 35 of the American pageant titled The Cold War Begins from 1945 to 1952. As always, we're going to be using the 16th edition of the American pageant. If you have an earlier or later edition or a completely different textbook, don't worry about it. The content's going to be the same. So to start off, let's talk about key concepts, rather lack thereof. Obviously, I don't put in key concepts anymore because of copyright, but if you do want to reference the key concepts, they should be located at the beginning of every chapter in the American pageant, and I highly recommend you do reference them at least once because it can really help with organization and recalling information on the AP exam in a really efficient way. So I definitely recommend you try it at least once if you haven't already. So to start off, let's talk about what's going to happen post-World War II. For one, you should know about President Truman, who was FDR's vice president, that took over following his sudden death, and he was a relatively average person, he had no college education, and despite his initial humility in handling international conflicts, he soon grew to face challenges with unexpected courage. But before we talk about Truman and the conflicts he's going to face in the post-war era, let's talk a little bit about some stuff that happened while FDR was still alive and the war was still going strong. For one, you should know about the Yalta Conference, which happens in February of 1945. FDR, Churchill, and Stalin meet in Yalta to discuss some post-war plans, and they decided that they would eventually occupy Germany and ensure that Romania, Bulgaria, and Poland had free elections and representative governments. Of course, none of this um, was binding at all, and Stalin will eventually break this agreement later on. But immediately after the conference, the Soviet Union does agree to attack Japan following the collapse of Germany, since the American army would probably sustain heavy losses alone. In exchange, the Soviet Union secured major holdings in Asia, like Chinese ports, railroads, and islands that they had lost to Japan. And keep in mind that Russia is now being ruled by a revolutionary Bolshevik government, which the U.S. refused to recognize as valid. And in 1945, the U.S. terminated the Lend-Lease aid that they were giving to Russia. In response to this, Moscow asked for a reconstruction, which the U.S. denied, while approving another loan for Britain. So clearly, tensions are already flaring between the U.S. and Russia. And this led Russia to creating their own spheres of influence, in other words, building alliances with the neighboring countries, in order to guarantee their own financial security. So they're basically saying to the U.S. that they don't need them, they're worthless to them, and that they're going to prove that they're capable on their own. Um, this directly contradicted former U.S. President Wilson's plan for an open world, where all countries were demilitarized and democratized in order to promote world peace. And this will all build up into what becomes known as the Cold War from 1947 to 1991. This was the standoff between the U.S. and Russia, essentially between capitalist and communist ideologies. And it was called a Cold War because there weren't really many battles, per se. There weren't, like, soldiers fighting wars abroad or anything. It was just rising tensions constantly. And both wanted to prove that their ideology was superior, which we'll talk more about later. Um, and ultimately, the U.S. wants to prevent communism from spreading. And in case you were wondering this at this point, um, the U.S. and Russia were only allies during World War II, really out of necessity. They didn't really have any other choice. Um, and now that everything has settled with regards to um, World War II, they can actually fight each other and prove that they're superior to the other. But moving on, you should know about the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. The Allies met in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and this conference led to the creation of the IMF, also known as the International Monetary Fund, to encourage world trade by regulating currency exchange rates and the creation of the World Bank to promote economic growth in underdeveloped areas. The U.S. was instrumental in these international peacekeeping organizations and, in general, transforming the post-war landscape, while Russia, for the most part, refused to participate. However, the exception to Russia's otherwise isolationist foreign policy was the United Nations, which was formed in April of 1945. It had representatives from 50 countries, but the big five were really the U.S., Britain, the USSR, France, and China, who had additional privileges like the right to veto. The U.N. as a whole also provided international aid through UNESCO, which was a U.N. Um, educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, the FAO, which was the Food and Agricultural Organization, and the WHO, which was the World Health Organization. And in the UN, this guy named Bernard Baruch wanted to create an agency which would regulate atomic energy internationally to ensure that no one was using it carelessly or irresponsibly, but neither the US or Russia wanted to give up certain nuclear weapons, which shows how tensions remain high between both of them and they want to be prepared for a potential conflict. Aside from that, you should know about the Nuremberg Trials from 1945 to 1946. Former Nazi leaders were put on trial in Nuremberg, Germany, and punished for their crimes against humanity, with the punishments ranging from long prison sentences to execution. 
And keep in mind that as much as the Allies wanted to punish Germany, either by destroying their factories to prevent them from being too strong, or by having them pay heavy reparations to rebuild other countries, they soon realized that a flourishing German economy was necessary for the recovery of Europe as a whole. So although they hated Germany and everything they had done to basically destroy everyone around them, they really had to make sure that they were successful. Otherwise, they would take out the entirety of Europe with them. And um, it was just important in terms of long term success. But moving on, let's talk a little bit more about some of the causes of the Cold War and how certain events in the post-war era are going to lead to it. And it really starts with um, Germany splitting into four military occupation zones, with one assigned to each of the four big powers. So one went to the USSR, one went to France, one went to Britain, and one went to the US. And keep in mind that the Soviet Union is still really upset that Germany isn't going to pay the reparations. And while the Allies tried to promote the idea of a reunited Germany eventually when everything has sort of settled and they rebuilt um, and produced a more stable economy, the Soviet Union tightens its communist grip on the eastern area it controls. Soon enough, West Germany, which was controlled by the US, became an independent country, while East Germany became a Soviet satellite state, which was shut off from the rest of the Western world. This separation of Germany is an example of the Iron Curtain, which refers to the Soviet Union's attempt to shield itself and satellite states with communism separating itself from the rest of capitalist Europe. And you should note that at this point, Berlin is completely surrounded by Soviet occupation zones, so Stalin tries to cut off Allied access to Berlin by blocking railways and highways, hoping to starve them. And this leads to the Berlin Airlift from 1948 to 1949, where President Truman sends supplies to grateful Berliners for a year, hoping to show that the US won't back down and appease Stalin. Stalin eventually does lift the blockade, but Germany remains divided. You should also know that Stalin manages to broker a deal with Iran in 1946, agreeing to remove some of his troops there, which were left over from World War II, in exchange for some oil concessions. He ends up using the troops to finance a rebel movement, which Truman publicly disapproved of, causing Stalin to back down. And all of these actions further show the US that Stalin doesn't want to continue the wartime partnership they had formed into the post-war era, which further increases tensions between the two powers. And these rising tensions will also be reflected in American foreign policy. For example, George Kennan, an American diplomat, writes the Containment Doctrine in 1947, which stated that Russia was dangerously expansionist, meaning they were willing to conquer as much land as possible no matter what the cost was, which was really disconcerting because that sounded a lot like Germany pre-World War II. And the only way to defeat communism was to treat it like a virus. So in other words, quarantine or contain the communist ideology to prevent other countries from falling to it. This tough on Russia policy will also dictate Truman's policies going forward. For example, you have the Truman Doctrine in 1947, where the US provides military and economic aid amounting to about $400 million to prevent Greece and Turkey from falling to communism. So essentially, Truman is agreeing to give aid to any countries who are facing communist pressure. However, critics of Truman said that he was overreacting, possibly allowing leaders of foreign countries to take advantage of his kindness by guaranteeing them unlimited resources to defeat any perceived threats. Essentially, any leader can say that they're being pressured by communists, even if they're not, to get aid from the US that could be used for other domestic concerns. And although Truman was polarizing the world by splitting countries into either pro-Soviet or pro-American camps, supporters said it was necessary to ensure global unity and cooperation in defeating communism. Meanwhile, France, Italy, and Germany were still struggling from the economic chaos that followed the war. And so to alleviate this, Secretary of State George Marshall told the countries that if they created a joint recovery plan, the U.S. would provide them with financial assistance to carry it out. And also note here that the U.S. did offer some aid to Russia if they made some political reforms, but Russia refused. And this plan eventually turned into what became known as the Marshall Plan in 1947. This gave billions of dollars in aid to 16 European countries and allowed them to rapidly rebuild, creating flourishing economies while the communists lost most of their power um, in those areas. So this is really a huge success for the U.S. And again, just to reiterate this point, the Cold War was not a fighting war with battles but it wasn't peacetime either, which is why it's called a Cold War, the tension is frozen. Both countries are going to take measures to increase security and treat it as if they're preparing for war, but there isn't actually going to be any real battles. For example, you have the passage of the NSA, also known as the National Security Act in 1947. This created the Department of Defense to have a more unified military body with efficient communication. It also created the NSC, which was the National Security Council, to advise the president about the best course of action in security matters. 
but really the most notable part of this act is that it created the CIA to gather intel on foreign affairs and run covert foreign operations in order to push the American agenda on an international scale. So for example, it was used to overthrow Iran's leader and installed a new one that was chosen by the US. Aside from that, you should know about NATO, which was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization formed in 1949. This consisted of capitalist nations like Britain, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, the US obviously, and more, and made a pact to prepare for a potential enemy attack, saying that if one country got attacked, the others would all come to its aid. Essentially, an attack on one is an attack on all. All for one and one for all, um, sort of like a Three Musketeers type of thing, but with many more countries. But overall, this is a really significant development because it marked a departure from the American Diplomatic Convention of Isolationism, which included avoiding alliances during peacetime. Obviously, this isn't peacetime right now. There is definitely some animosity with Russia, but they aren't in any direct wars, and they definitely don't want to get involved in another country's wars. Um, it also boosted European unification and overall served as an important step in militarization leading up to the Cold War. But moving on, let's talk about the impact that the Cold War is going to have in Asia. For example, you should know that General Douglas MacArthur is put in charge of quote-unquote rebuilding Japan, which in this case just means democratizing Japan, which is much easier compared to actually rebuilding Japan. Um, Japanese war criminals were put to trial in Tokyo, where some of them were actually executed. And keep in mind that the Japanese were sort of forced to cooperate because they knew that less resistance would ultimately speed up the end of U.S. occupation there. They also adopted a MacArthur-dictated constitution in 1946, which created a Western-style democratic government. And eventually, Japan's economy was thriving, which ironically challenged America's monopoly as the dominant industrial power in the world. So this is yet another post-war success for the U.S. Meanwhile, in 1949, the Chinese nationalist government is forced to flee to Taiwan after the communists, led by Mao Zedong, take over the country. And this marks a really depressing loss for America and its allies because now a quarter of the world's population is under communist control. And the situation dramatically worsens when soon after Russia explodes their first atomic bomb, much to the surprise of Truman and other American allies. And really now everyone's sort of scared of the power that Russia has because America thought it would keep Russia in line with the threat of using nuclear weapons, but now that threat is useless because Russia has developed nuclear weapons of their own. And so in response to this, Truman orders the development of the H-bomb, also known as a hydrogen bomb, which first explodes in 1952. Russia responds with their own H-bomb in 1953, starting a dangerously competitive cycle in the nuclear arms race. But now let's talk a little bit about what's happening in Korea. You should note that following Japan's downfall in 1945, Korea, which at this point was a Japanese colony, splits along the 38th parallel line with the Soviets controlling the North and the US controlling the South, essentially setting up rival regimes. This leads to the creation of the NSC 68 in 1950, which was a document created by the NSC that recommended that the US increase their defense spending and be stricter with their containment policy towards Russia. And although this plan initially seemed impossible to implement, following the invasion of South Korea by the Soviet North Korean forces in June of 1950, Truman ordered a buildup that was much greater than necessary. In addition to this, Truman convinces the UN to declare North Korea an aggressor and sends troops led by General MacArthur to South Korea. Other UN nations, of course, also send troops as well, and Truman sends further air and naval units without congressional support, so the Korean War has officially begun. And so in September of 1950, General MacArthur and his troops pushed the North Korean forces past the 38th parallel. However, Chinese volunteers came to the defense of North Korea, creating a stalemate. And during this time, General MacArthur began advocating for a more aggressive approach, like blockading China and using nuclear weapons, and criticized Truman's limited war strategy. He really believed that Truman was essentially ensuring that the U.S. would never defeat communism. Truman fires him eventually, deciding to maintain his approach because he didn't want to focus all of the resources on China since Russia was the greater threat. Meanwhile, domestically, people are growing more and more afraid that communist spies have infiltrated American society. This led to the creation of multiple organizations. For example, you have the HUAC, the House Un-American Activities Committee, which was formed in 1938, this search for communist influence in American life and subversion, in other words, opposition to government. And eventually, in 1948, a member of the committee named Richard Nixon accuses prominent ex-New Dealer Alger Hiss of being a communist, and this starts a communist spy hunt. Hiss and others are questioned by the committee on TV, and this becomes a televised drama that people become really invested in, because they want to see these alleged communists punished and suffer. And ultimately, 
Hiss is convicted of perjury because he lied a couple times while on trial, and he's sentenced to five years in prison. And this is also seen in the Rosenberg trial, where Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who are accused of selling atomic bomb plans developed by American scientists to Russia, are given death sentences. And this really leads to debate over whether or not the hunt is becoming excessive, because the Rosenbergs had two children, and now those children are orphans. And a lot of people felt sympathy for them. So at what point is it okay to um, sort of pursue this communist hunt and at what point does it cross the ideals of American society? Aside from that, another organization you should know about is the Loyalty Review Board in 1947. This investigated for possible communist spies in government and out of 3 million federal employees, 3,000 were dismissed or resigned with no formal indictment. So the board probably convicted thousands of innocent people to create a guise of security and reduce public panic. And later, in 1949, 11 communists are sent to prison for violating the Smith Act, which was a peacetime anti-sedition law, trying to overthrow the government. The ruling is upheld in the Supreme Court case Dennis v. United States in 1951. But moving on, let's talk about the Red Scare that's going to occur domestically. And it really starts when some conservative politicians believe that communist influences were the reason for declining religiousness, increased sexual freedoms, and the new civil rights movements. And this led many, including Truman, to realize that the hunt for communists was turning into a witch hunt. And because of this, in 1950, Truman vetoes the McCarran Internal Security Bill, which would have allowed Truman to arrest or detain suspicious people during an internal security emergency. Critics called it concentration camp tactics, but Congress passes it anyways over the veto. And these events are indicative of what will become known as McCarthyism. This was the practice of spreading treasonous accusations without any actual evidence, and it was named after Senator Joe McCarthy, who claimed that Secretary of State Acheson had intentionally hired 200 people from the Communist Party to serve in the federal government. Obviously, he had no proof for this, and he never produced any, but regardless, people still bought it. And McCarthy's so-called investigations were ruthless because he was essentially ending the careers of many prominent people and damaging America's reputation among the international community. However, most of the American public actually approved of these tactics because it sort of kept up with the illusion of security that they wanted to create, even though there was no evidence to support these claims. Um, so in some ways, McCarthy is just throwing out these accusations like he's Oprah, and people are taking it because they want to believe that they are weeding out all of the communists in government, and it gives them a sense of security. However, people soon agreed that he went too far when he accused the U.S. Army of being full of communist spies. The Army obviously fought back the allegations in the Army MacArthur hearings of 1954, which ultimately exposed McCarthy's extremism and led to his eventual disgrace. But really, the most important thing about the Red Scare is that it made the U.S. have to live up to its own democratic ideals, which helped the cause of various civil rights advocates. In other words, if the nation didn't recognize the demands made by these organizations, they were essentially being hypocrites. How can you say that you live up to these high-minded democratic ideals when you're not even going to give them to your own citizens? And this led Truman to pass Executive Order 9981, um, which was created in 1948, and desegregated the armed forces and abolished discrimination on the grounds of race, religion, or anything else. Moving on, let's talk about some of the domestic affairs going on during this time. For example, you should know that the economy is still struggling after the initial post-war years as prices of consumer goods increased because wartime price controls were now removed. And because of this, a series of labor strikes also occurred across the country. This led to the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, which outlawed closed shop businesses, meaning any stores that only hired employees who were already in the union and made unions responsible for any damages that incurred during disputes. It passed over Truman's veto, marking a significant defeat for labor. And keep in mind that during this time, the labor movement is going to try to organize historically anti-union areas like the West and the South in what becomes known as the CIO's Operation Dixie. Um, which occurs in 1948, but this ultimately failed because Southerners were reluctant to work with African Americans, there were still some racial tensions um, lingering there, and it was really hard to get them to cooperate with one another. Aside from that, you should know about the Employment Act of 1946, which declared government economic policy should aim to promote max employment, production, and keep inflation low. It also established a three-person board to advise the president on economic policy. And one really important bill you should know about is the GI Bill in 1944. This allotted money to send World War II veterans to school so that they could get jobs, so that they wouldn't be unemployed and further deepen the existing depression. This raised education levels nationwide and stimulated the construction industry. 
But moving on, let's talk about the election, specifically the election of 1948. Republicans nominate Thomas Dewey, while Democrats nominate Truman, after Eisenhower says that he won't run. Now keep in mind, Southern Democrats dislike Truman because he supported civil rights for African Americans, so they nominate Governor Strom Thurmond, while the Progressive Party nominates Henry Wallace. And people fully expect Dewey to win, but Truman actually ends up being reelected. And in his inaugural address, Truman introduces the Point Four plan, which suggests that the U.S. send aid money to underdeveloped countries to help them grow. So he hoped to stop countries from ever becoming communists in the first place, and this actually ended up helping a lot of developing countries. You should also know about the Fair Deal in 1949. This advocated for many liberal reforms like raising the minimum wage, creating public housing, and extending social security benefits, but Congress only let a few pass. And as a general note, just keep in mind that from the 1950s to the 1970s, the American economy grew rapidly and people are going to become very wealthy. Most post-war jobs also went to women as the service industry soon outgrew manufacturing, but society continued to glorify women's traditional role as a homemaker, which would be a key factor in the upcoming feminist movement. And finally, last but not least, the last slide of the chapter. Finally, <laughs> this chapter was super long, so thank you for bearing with me for the past however many minutes, but really all we have to talk about are a couple of key concepts and then we're good to go. So first, you should know that lots of military spending helped sustain the new economic boom and stimulated new technology industries like aerospace and electronics. Research and development in science was prioritized to ensure that the US stayed ahead of competitors, particularly Russia. You should also note that more technology and better education led to increased productivity, which further helped the economy. The mechanization of agriculture also increased productivity, which meant farmers had to find other means of income. And you're also going to see that during this time, people moved towards the country more. So the Sun Belt, an area of 15 states in the south from Virginia to California, grew twice as fast as the Northeast. The Sun Belt also had better climate and lower taxes and received more federal money than the North. And similarly, many white Americans moved to the suburbs, with organizations like the FHA, the Federal Housing Association, and the VA, the Veterans Administration, making it more affordable to buy a house in the suburbs instead of an apartment in the cities. And this led to what became known as white flight, which left African Americans and other minorities in poverty-stricken inner cities, especially since the FHA didn't grant loans to African Americans. And finally, last but not least, the baby boom drastically increases the birth rate in the post-war era, which is why people born in this generation are called baby boomers. And yeah, that does it for this chapter. Here are the credits for how I got everything you just saw. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below if you have any questions, and please be sure to like and subscribe, all of that. It really helps me out and lets me know that these videos are helpful for you so that I can make more videos in the future. Um, so yeah, see you in the next video.